Hello and welcome to this video on the let typing rule in the Hindley Milner type system. This is part of a mini series on the Hindley Milner typing rules, which is part of a wider Hindley Milner series. If you haven't seen the previous videos, I'd recommend you do so. So, as with the previous videos, let's have a look at the typing rule and break it down into its component parts. So, let's start with expressions. We've got a few here e0, so some generic expression e0, x, so some variable expression x, e1, another general expression, and then we've got the actual let binding itself, which is let x equals e0 in e1. Next, we can spot the types. So we've got a few polytypes here, sigmas and taus. And then we've got the assignments. So we've got a expression and then the has type of a colon operator and then a type. That is our assignments. So it says e0 has type sigma, x has type sigma, e1 has type tau. And then the whole let expression let x equals e0 in e1 has type tau. So let's try reading through this rule. Again, we've got this rule structure. So we've got an if then uh, setup where if the premise holds, then the conclusion holds. So starting on that if statement, we've got if from the context gamma, it follows that the expression E0 has type sigma. And from the context gamma plus the assignment, the variable x has type sigma. It follows that the expression E1 has type tau. So we're taking it in slightly bigger chunks than we have in previous videos, but hopefully now we've got a bit more understanding of what these rules are in the syntax. If not, go back and rewatch the videos, especially the function abstraction one, which should hopefully help you with the syntax. Okay, let's continue on with the bottom half. So we've got then from the context gamma, it follows that the expression let x equals e0 in e1 has type tau, right? So it's just a assignment from the context. Let's try and get a bit of an intuition for this rule. If you want to pause and think about why this might make sense to you, Again, maybe you can try coming up with the rule yourself and seeing if you get basically the same thing or something similar. Maybe that will help you develop an intuition. But here's my intuition for it. If we bind an expression E0 to a variable X with type sigma, and doing so results in the let body E1 having type tau, then the let statement as a whole has type tau. And this is kind of similar to what we saw for function abstraction or function application, kind of both in one, really, because the x equals e0 in e1, right? The x equals 0 is kind of like the argument into the function, and the x and the e1 is like our parameter and function body for function abstraction. So thinking about those two rules, application and abstraction, this is kind of the mix of those two. Let's see a practical example. Hopefully that might help. So we've got some context gamma, where we have this assignment for gt, saying that gt has the type int to interval. So it's a function that takes in an integer and returns another function from integer to bool. And provided we have uh, a question like, what is the type of let a equals two in gt3a, given the context gamma, we can then answer that with our rule. So again, let's write this out in simples where we're saying from the context gamma, it follows that let a equals two in gt3a has what type? Well, this is a let statement, so we can write out our let statement rule. Substituting it in, well, the a kind of looks like the parameter x. The uh, expression e0 looks just like the number 2. The e1 looks like gt3a. Just trying to match those that kind of let binding statement to the let statement in the rule. And next, we can make some assumptions about what the types might be. Or again, you could work upwards and figure out, well, these are the type constraints that the rule imposes and do the unification process. But for the sake of time, I will say, well, let's, how about we try sigma is int and tau is bool. So we'll try substituting all that in and we get this. And there we have an answer. So we can say that the result of this is bool, provided that the top two, the premise uh, holds. So the premise holds, the conclusion holds, right? So we're not quite finished with the proof, although we've figured out that maybe the type could be bool if the two statements above hold, uh, we still need to prove those statements. So on the left hand side, we could say, well, two is an integer, probably because we have some literal rule. And on the right, we've got some function application and some variable rules to apply if you wanted to try finishing off the proof.
Thanks for watching. In the next video, we're going to look at instantiation and following that generalization, which are the two rules that don't directly derive from the syntax.